Mina, come on, Jesus freaking gamer here. Sunday video, yeah, I, I know, I'm very well aware it's it's Tuesday, and I completely messed up. And also, not only is the 30 minute message out late, not only that, I haven't done a biblical message in like what a week? Or I did one. I did one. So, I apologize for that. Um, I have been severely, royally messing up and slacking off. There are things that I need to do and things I need to get done, but that was no reason to not put out, like, you know, an under 10 minute unedited Bible message based on my spending time with the Lord that day, which I, I did do. I did that. So, I could have put out the video, and I just. I didn't. I did other things. So, you know, until I stop doing YouTube or unless I take a, you know, like a break like I did around Christmas time, I should be putting out a video. So, one more time, certainly not the last time, I am sorry for that. Um, but here's this 30 minute message. Doggone it. Gonna get this done today. And this is part two to the wonderful message. <laughs> My gosh. If you don't believe Jesus was real, you're stupid, part one. So this is, if you don't believe Jesus was real, you're stupid, part two. Didn't quite cover all the points that I wanted to cover, so I am here to cover those points, or the remaining points today, and I should be able to do this within the remainder of time of this part two. And just to reiterate some of the basic points from part one, of all of the arguments that I've heard from non-Christians, uh, from liberal Christians, from scholars on the left and even the ultra-left side of the fence, the most ludicrous argument I think I've ever heard is that Jesus was not a historical figure. I understand that a lot of people disagree about him being God in the flesh, about him rising from the dead. I get that. And a lot of those people aren't necessarily intellectually dishonest or intellectually uh, invalids. But to deny the historicity of Christ with the amount of evidence that we have is tantamount to stupidity. So I really don't feel the need to be overly nice or overly cautious on this one subject. I welcome comments in the comment section down below. If anyone wants to challenge this position, I would love to hear a case against the arguments that I have presented, both in part one, which I will present here in part two. I'd love to hear arguments against the things that I'm saying. Um, even if a few valid points can be made, the amount of evidence for Jesus' historicity is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. It almost, I mean, technically with the skeptical view of history, and I tend to have a little bit of one myself, you, you can't really nail down a lot of stuff prior to the printing press. A lot of it is up for grabs. Heck, even stuff since the printing press, I think we've all seen the amount of times that the media, which is supposed to reliably give us the news, has messed up and gotten the information wrong. Anyone who looks up information on the internet can tell that there are a wide array of opinions. And certainly not all of them can be right, as many of them outright contradict and even shout out and put down other views. So there's no way that all of the information can be correct. So once you go back before even the printing press, history is a bit of a, a dicey thing. Nonetheless, if we're to be, believe in anything, if we're to accept any of the histories of this world, there are some things that's just pretty obvious. Like, okay, yeah, historically, this was legitimate. This was real. This happened. The existence of Jesus being one of those things. I covered in the first part how the Bible is... Obviously, it's like the primary source for Jesus' historicity. And to discount, you know, if you don't believe in the, in the supernatural tales and, again, the godhood, the resurrection of Jesus, I get it. I understand. Not everyone believes in Christianity. If everyone believed what the Bible said, everyone would be a Christian, and that's simply not the case. And you're not necessarily intellectually inferior for not being a Christian. I know plenty of intelligent, sensible non-Christians. I don't think they're right. I think they're horribly wrong. But I wouldn't go so far as to call them stupid. But to ignore the Bibles as a historical document, to ignore, ignore the Bible's testimonies over and over and over again, especially when you have four different testimonies about the life of the central figure of the New Testament, which is the most accounted for book in the history of mankind, literally. To discount that story altogether and discount all portions and all written records of it, not just, you know, nitpicking various words and phrases and typos from the original documents, but to say all of it's hogwash and all of it is, you know, can be thrown out and discounted 
and counted for nothing. That is, that is stupid. That is intellectually dishonest. I think the Bible alone provides a good case for the historicity of Christ, but not just the Bible. We also have, I mentioned in the last video, the, the accounts of Tacitus and Pliny the Younger, Romans who were definitely against the Christian faith, but they mentioned Jesus in their histories. Now I want to move on to some bigger fish, so to speak. Um, I covered a lot of the, well, the, the Bible's the biggest fish of them all, but I want to move into some secular histories that are much more well-known. One in particular, you see that book behind me? We're going to get into that here in a few minutes. Before I mention that, though, I want to mention one other source, and it's not secular, it is religious, and interestingly enough, it comes from the enemies of Jesus. It comes from the Pharisaic tradition, and I'm talking about the Jewish Talmud. That has several mentions of Jesus in there. Now, once again, I'm going to be using the book, The Case for Christ. Um, it's a, I definitely can recommend the book by Lee Strobel. It has a lot of good stuff in it. It's not in-depth and in detail on every single bit of history in regards to the Bible, literary criticism, the historicity of Jesus, evidence for the resurrection. You can look, just look at the, the, the thickness of the book, and it's not the most in-depth book out there, but as far as something that covers surface topics, as far as that gives something that gives you references and gives you books you can follow up on to get the specific details, I really couldn't recommend it more. It has a lot of footnotes, as I'm going to, as I pointed out in the first video, we're going to do so again. And the Talmud, I'm going to cover a few things first from this book, and then I'm going to cover a few things that are not mentioned in this book that I have read elsewhere, because this book is not my only source of study. Now, in this book, let me see here. Okay, I'm on page 86 in chapter, what is this chapter? Do, 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 do. Chapter 4, The Corroborating Evidence. And here is a quote from a Professor M. Wilcox. And here is the quote, The Jewish traditional literature, although it mentions Jesus only quite sparingly, and must in any case be used with caution, supports the gospel claim that he was a healer and miracle worker, even though it ascribes these activities to sorcery. In addition, it preserves the recollection that he was a teacher, and that he had disciples, five of them, and that at least in the earlier rabbinic period, not all of the sages had finally made up their minds that he was a heretic or a deceiver. Now this is once again chapter four. So I'm gonna to go to the I'm gonna do what I did in the first thing, go to the back of the book, chapter four, and this has the number twelve um, at the end of this quote. And twelve, um, M. Wilcox, Jesus in the light of his Jewish environment, and then some long German title. And then at the end of the German title, number 25.1, and then the year and the page number. So, yeah, there you, there you go. Um, the Talmud itself also mentions Jesus. It taught, His enemies talk about his existence, and even the fact that miracles were done by him. And of course, they believed in miracles. I understand a lot of people nowadays don't believe in miracles. I've told y'all I'm one of those crazy charismatic types. I don't only believe miracles exist. I believe I have seen some in my lifetime. I actively pursue them. I'm also one of those nutty tongue talkers. Um, I believe and practice speaking in tongues. I do all those crazy things. So miracles, I readily accept them. Um, not even just from the Christian source. I do believe that the devil himself also can perform miracles, albeit false ones, and in no way sanctioned or in agreement with God. And earlier on, up at the beginning, um, before, I think it was Yamauchi, Dr. Yamauchi, yeah, that's, that's the one that um, Lee Strobel is talking to here. He mentions a few paragraphs above this, still page 86, Jews as a whole did not go into great detail about heretics, he replied. There are a few passages in the Talmud that mention Jesus, calling him a false messiah who practiced magic and who was justly condemned to death. They also repeat the rumor that Jesus was born of a Roman soldier and Mary, suggesting there was something unusual about his birth. And I will mention, all, first I'll mention as far as the footnotes, if you want specific details and you want to question someone's sources, the vast majority of books nowadays quote their sources. Um, if a book doesn't quote their source, throw that book out. If you're looking for facts, if you're looking for history, if you're looking for details, and this book is purporting to be non-fiction, and it doesn't quote its sources, 
throw it out, have nothing to do with it. I haven't seen a book that didn't quote sources in, I don't know, forever. Unless it was like you know, a badly done, you know, high school or college paper. Any professionally edited book will quote its sources if it is in any way nonfiction. And this is no this is no different. So if you want to look into something, if you want to get the nitty gritty of something, look at the sources. Take the time to look at the annotations in the back of the book. And I want to emphasize once again, as I do in all of my 30 minute messages, if you are looking into the gospel of Jesus Christ, or really any religion for that matter, we're talking about your eternal soul. We're talking about something that transcends this current life and death itself. We're talking about eternity. There is not really going to be a much more important subject, unless you have concluded that this is, that it's all fake. It's all false, and there is in no way, shape, or form any kind of God or any kind of eternity or any kind of supernatural, any supernaturalism. Yeah, that, that's a word now. Unless you've, for, unless you've looked into it and come to that conclusion, there really isn't a more important question than who are you? You know, how'd you get here? Where are you going? What's your purpose? You're not going to find a more important set of questions than that. And if you have concluded that everything is purely natural, uh, me and you, of course, would have severe disagreements. And as I continue to look into other faiths, other religions, and other points of views, despite the fact that I'm pretty settled in my Christianity, I still I keep my feelers out there. Like, you know, what are people saying? What's the newest thing on the block? I still pay attention. Um, I would encourage any open-minded fellows to do the same as well. Because as a Christian, I don't think Jesus and the Bible are going anywhere in my belief system. However, there are other, there are points of views that may be completely opposite of mine that may still help to improve or sharpen my current views and belief systems. So I try to keep an open mind even to completely radically different and opposing ideals and ideas and worldviews to mine. Because at that point, if I close myself off and say, I'm done, I'm finished, there's nothing past this. I've kind of cut myself off from learning. I've declared myself the singular authority on everything in regards to whatever it is that I'm not learning it anymore and I've completely closed myself off to. And at that point, it's just, it's me, it's me not being open to anything anymore. And I don't believe that to be wisdom. I don't believe that to be a good idea. What usually happens when you do that, and I do speak from experience um, from the years when I fell away from God, what usually happens when you close yourself off and say, okay, I'm done, I'm finished, I'm good, it's usually at that point, a lot of people do that out of insecurity and fear that they may actually be wrong, so they make sure that they shut out all opposition so they can't possibly be wrong, and so their self-esteem and their facts are actually quite, um, quite poor. Also, when you when you're when you're legitimately convinced that you're absolutely right and there's nothing past you, when you've come to that point of pride, it's usually also at that point where you experience a great fall. Usually, when you, once you're convinced you've got it all down pat and nothing's going to oppose you, usually somewhere around that time something comes around and opposes you very, very strongly. I and mean, I personally view that as the grace of God um, knocking you on your thick head, saying, "Hey." You're a fallible human. You don't get it all. Don't close yourself off. Guess what? There are some intelligent people on the other side of this argument. Like I said, people that are not Christians, they're not all dumb. They're not all senseless, mindless idiots that I have nothing to do with. No. They have some reasonable things to say and some reasonable arguments. And even if I completely disagree with them at the end of the day about the existence of God and the Bible as an authority and Jesus being the one true God, they still have things that they can say and make me question, make me think about that will prove me wrong on maybe not the big issue about who God is, but on points of my faith, on points of even my personal faith and my personal walk with Jesus. They'll correct some things and point out some things that I'm not doing or I'm not thinking quite right. So again, try to stay open-minded, try to receive those things. And I'd be very, very surprised that if you're watching this video 14 minutes in, that you're not open to these things in some way, shape, or form. I also want to mention, aside from this book, aside from The Case for Christ, I have read in another book, you guys can't see it, it's off to this side in my room, I have a very, very miniature library over there. It's, it's nowhere near, it's not like hundreds of books or anything, it's 
nothing that big or fancy, but I have quite a few books on my two bookshelves over there. They, those two bookshelves are filled, and a lot of those books are nonfiction books. A lot of those books are historical books, um, theological books, and it. And I just I look into this stuff on a pretty regular basis, and I have a big old thick book on the Trinity over there. Um, and the biggest chapter in the Trinity is actually dealing with the Son of God, Jesus. And in this book, the Talmud is mentioned, and several passages are quoted very specifically, once again pointing out who Jesus was, what Jesus did. And pretty much along the same lines of what I just read in here. But that author brings up a very interesting point in how, in some of the more recent editions, I forget when they started doing this. Um, I want to say it was somewhere around the 16th century, because the Talmud goes way, 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 way back. It's or, I want to say it's origination. Um, they are the they're the written accounts of the oral tradition of the Pharisees, of the scholarly Jews that go that even predate Jesus' existence in this world as a human. And the Talmud writes down a lot of these oral traditions. And so it, it's a very, very old collection of books. It's encyclopedic in nature, but around, I want to say, the 16th century or so, some editors decided to get rid of the mentions of Jesus altogether. And you will not find Jesus mentioned in some contemporary versions of the Talmud. And the reason for this, the reason for doing this after over 1,500 years, the only real reason I can think of for doing this is to deny the historicity of Jesus altogether to wipe him out of history because he's so troublesome and so problematic, especially for the Jews. And I know the church has done a lot of bad things to the Jews. And on behalf of the Christian church, I'd like to say I am sorry to any Jew who may be watching this video. I'm not personally anti-Semitic. I worship a Jew. I don't understand. I mean, Jesus is Jewish, and he still has a human body. He's a Jew. Um, and our God is the Jewish, historically the Jewish God. I have no idea how anti-Semitism got, got into the church. I guess it's because the Jews played a part in the crucifixion of Jesus. And they said, upon us and upon our descendants may his blood be. Nonetheless, um, he died, theologically he died for everyone's sin. So everyone had a hand in crucifying Jesus. Um, that's the Christian perspective. So again, anti-Semitism doesn't make sense to me. Like, if I was to be racist, I can't imagine it being against the people who my God, one, is now a member of in the flesh, and two, historically was a member of in the past. I, I don't get it. So I am deeply sorry for, for that and for the Christian treatment of the Jews in the past. There are some atrocious records, um, to say the least. And I, I, aside from that, I also know that the person of Jesus is very troubling to the Jews. Um, to say that Messiah has come, and he hasn't come in such a way as where Israel is now the top nation in the world, as the prophets in the Old Testament proclaim, I understand that is a big, big problem for several Jewish people. That is the only reason I can think of the person of Jesus and who he is and the religion that has sprung up in his name. It's troublesome. It's problematic for Jewish theology. And that's the only reason I can think of for the Jewish scholars and Jewish editors back in the 16th century to wipe out the name of Jesus from the Talmud. That's, that's essentially, you are editing a transcript. When you edit a transcript, because it says things, you, you, you may think, you know, well, hey, I don't want to give this person undue credit. I don't want to, you know, spread this person's propaganda. When you edit a transcript, you destroy the very credibility that you're trying to promulgate. You're trying to put out what the, you know, what whoever it was said what was said in the transcript. When you alter that, you have com you've compromised not only the transcript's credibility, you've compromised your own credibility. If it says some stuff you know, feel free to put your spin on it. Feel free to put as many footnotes and annotations and dissertations on it as you want. But don't alter the original document. When you do that, all it does is hurt your cause and hurt what you're trying to do. And the people who alter the Talmud, um, that is, golly, that, that is a literary and a historical crime. You know, 
speak as much crap as you want to about Jesus. Don't try to pretend he never existed. Or even if you want to pretend he never existed, don't alter the fact that your ancestors spoke of him and believed he was at least a historical figure and a sorcerer um, and a... And, um, Quite, I don't mean this as a curse word, quite literally a bastard son. Um, Mary and some Roman soldier, for example, you know, he wasn't a legitimate, he wasn't a legitimate Jewish child, probably not even wholly Jewish. You know, they were, and you know, he died justly. He deserved his death on the cross. So speak as much crap on him as you want, but don't deny his historicity. You're only hurting your own cause in the end there. And hopefully I'm not speaking to too many Jewish editors and scholars this day and age. Hopefully that level of intellectual dishonesty that settled in at that period of time, hopefully that is no longer there and not present to this day. Um, if it is, and I don't know, I haven't looked into it, but if it is, there are plenty of historical documents of the ancient Talmud where Jesus is mentioned um, completely. It's not even mentioned in Lee Strobel's book. It's not even talked about here because the ancient records are there. We have those we have those ancient manuscripts and copies of the Talmud. So, you know, unless you destroy those, which I don't think any sane historian would do for the sake of historical records, um, no matter what your theology is, no matter what you believe, you're not going to destroy ancient historical records. Um, that's the motivation of, um, once again, those people who are completely shut out in their own little world, shut out in their own little minds, won't receive any new data, and those people do usually actively destroy opposing, not only opposing positions, they'll even destroy opposing data just for the sake of pushing forward their own argument, which is incredibly intellectually dishonest. Now to get into, uh, I don't know why I always think these things aren't going to be 30 minutes. Um, I'm going as fast as I can. You saw this book last time in the background? I want to, this is, I've got like eight minutes left. I want to get into the big evidence of who Jesus was. Well, I say the big evidence. The Bible's the biggest evidence. But this here is probably the most quoted secular source on Jesus, and that is the works of Josephus. Um, it looks like it's showing up properly in the video lens. It looks like you can, it's not showing up all backwards and stuff. So that, that's a good thing. That's a positive. And yes, I do have the complete works of Josephus in book form. Um, I received it from, excuse me, I received it from my father. So I actually didn't pay a penny for it. And have I read the whole thing? No, I have not. Um, I'd like to have said that I did. I wish I could say I undertook that scholarly endeavor. But I, I did not. Um, my college didn't enforce that kind of um, vigorous scholarly study. Um, it was much lighter than that which is a little bit unfortunate when I think about it. I've said several times I really don't think I learned a whole, whole lot from the Christian college I went to. Very, very little was new information to me, which is unfortunate. But I do have the book, and I have the quotes, and I have the sources, and this is the most talked about reference to Jesus in secular history. And now I want to do you guys a solid before I go into this evidence. If you go to... Google. I always say use Google and use it as a source to do your own online documentation, to do your own research. If you go to Google and type Josephus online, you can find his complete works. You'll find this entire book with everything in it online. You actually don't have to pay a penny for it. I personally don't like reading extensively online. I, I love my video games. It's, as obviously, Jesus Freaking Gamer, the name of my channel implies. I love my video games. I love the internet. I love the computer in general and things having to do with the computer. I don't, and I do read some things online. I don't like to do extensive reading, like entire books. I don't like to do that online. I personally prefer having the book itself. Um, kind of like I prefer reading the Bible from the Bible, and I don't just whip out my cell phone in church. I know a lot of people of the newer generation don't do that, I guess in that sense. I'm an, I'm an old timer. I just, I, I like doing it the old school way. So with that in mind, let's look at Josephus for a little bit. And I have, I have earmarked the two references that I want to look at. The first one is the smaller one, and this is going to be Jewish Antiquities, Book 20, Chapter 9. And now the book, I don't know if all the books have this. My book has in Chapter 9, there's like an emboldened one, and then a giant paragraph, and then there are other numbers in quotation marks. 
and I, I, I'm assuming this is simply for the sake of finding your information in the middle of such a giant archive, an, an encyclopedic type archive of books. So this is Josephus Jewish Antiquities, Chapter 9, emboldened 1, and then in parentheses number 200. When therefore Ananus was of this disposition, he thought he had now a proper opportunity to exercise his authority. Festus was now dead, and Albinus was but upon the road. So he assembled the Sanhedrin of judges, and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others, or some of his companions. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. The brother of G James, the, bro I was sorry, the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James. Boom. Right there. Name drop. The brother of Jesus who is called Christ. Um, someone who is a bit better known than James. Really nothing else is needed than that. It's right there. A mention of Jesus as a historical literary figure. Or not, I guess literally he didn't write any books himself, but as a, as a literal historical figure. Right there. Now to move on to the more controversial thing. I was like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and do that. I was like, my gosh, I, I don't know why I always sweat how much time I'm going to need, and then I just completely go over it. I, uh, why do I do that? Will I ever get over it? I've been doing this for a year, I'm still, and I'm still doing it. Ah! This, is the, this is the Testimonium Flavianum? Did I, I said that right. Yay! Check my source there. Very popular quote of Josephus about Jesus. This is Jewish Antiquities, Book 18, Chapter 3, Emboldened 3, and then in parentheses, Numbers 63 and 64. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct at this day. Now that, holy smoke, that is one heck of a documentation of who Jesus was. I mean, my gosh, boom, right there. Even calling him the Christ, and then he rose from again the third day. We have a believer here. Not only in a historical sense, but um, we have someone who was a Christian here. And I guess you could say, well, as a Christian, they had they would have good reason to um, to disavow, to disavow, um, or to I'm sorry, not to disavow, to di well, to disavow any views saying that Jesus wasn't Christ, but to include views that Jesus was Christ. But, interestingly enough, when you look, this, this is very, very hotly disputed and not without cause. Here's one of those things where as a Christian, I have to take a step back and just be like, it's not just Jesus, 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 you know, hold on. Something's a foul here. If you look at all of the early church fathers, all of them, whenever they're looking to other sources to prove who Jesus was and what Jesus did outside of the books of the Bible, Josephus always comes up. Always. However, um, this verse is not quoted until later on in church history. If you look at the earliest church fathers, so all of them mention, mention Josephus, but the earliest church fathers don't quote this passage here. They just don't. And on top of that, Oregon, one of the early Christian historians, he said that Josephus never was a believer. And that makes sense based on the first passage that I read where Jesus was called the Christ, not he was the Christ, as this passage here mentions. So something is fishy. Something is off. If you look at other external evidence, a few things are off. Now, we don't have any Greek manuscripts, which this was originally written in. Do we have any, I don't think, actually, even outside of the Greek language, I don't think we have any ancient documents of Josephus that exclude this passage in its current form. There I want to say, I did some research outside of, outside of Lee Schobel's book, just on my own, did some internet searching. I want to say there was at least one language where this passage wasn't quoted as is right here. But in the original language, in the Greek, we don't have a single version, historically, 
um, in our vast arrays and collections of historical texts where this passage is not said exactly like that. And when people, even though people quoted Josephus to mention Jesus' historicity, they don't use this quotation until later. But we don't have any quotations. We, I think only recently did we discover a, um, a copy of Josephus outside of the Greek language that says this a little bit different. Up until recently, all of Josephus that we had um, in every language, especially Greek, which was the principal and original language of this passage, they all said it just like this. But if he wasn't a Christian, why would he say it like that? The vast majority of scholars now, on both sides of the fence, Christian, non-Christian, conservative, liberal, they agree that what we have here is an example of an interpolation. We have people, Christians are the ones who primarily preserved Josephus. Josephus was perceived as a traitor among the Jews. Um, he basically went to the side of the Romans um, to spare his own life. Can't say as I blame him. And looking at this book, it doesn't look like he disavowed his Jewish heritage and his faith in the Jewish God. But going to the side of the Romans at all was viewed as a traitorous thing. But since he talks about biblical things, not just Jesus, I mean, he talks about James and many other things, many other historical, historically Christian things. And of course, you know, when you look in the, at uh, the book of Acts, there are several things mentioned in regards to Rome, the principal empire of the time where Christianity at first spread. And of course, in 300 AD, 313 specifically, it became the first Christian nation in history. So Christians found a lot of, they found a lot of historical goodness in Josephus. And what is likely that happened was these Christians were like, you know what, let's, let's, let's embellish this a little bit. Let's make Jesus look, let's make Jesus look a little bit better here. Let's make him look a, a little bit hotter in the eyes of the public. You know, like I said later on down the road, this was quoted all the time. Like, oh, look at this. Clear historical attestation outside of the Bible of Jesus and who he was. And most scholars nowadays believe that Christians interpolated in this passage. And what that means was that they added their spin to it. They added a few details. They added a few words and a few phrases. That does not inherently mean that this passage is completely false and needs to be completely removed. Very, very few scholars believe that this passage needs to be completely re removed. And the earlier passage in reference to James, even fewer scholars question that passage and the documentation behind that passage. That is pretty much unchallenged. This passage, because it's so blatant, is challenged very hotly. But again, most scholars agree now that this is a Christian interpolation. The Christians threw in a few of their own little ideas here. When Oregon says that he wasn't a Christian, the passage in reference to James, the brother of Jesus, says he was called to Christ, it's likely that the mention of Jesus here is authentic, albeit with embellishments, interpolations. So to give you just an idea of what the original text might have said, and there are various interpretations of how this passage was said originally, what the Christian interpolations were exactly, there are various theories. But he, just to give you an example in the English language of what the original might have said. Now, there was about this time Jesus, a wise man. For he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as... Uh, actually, hold on. That sounds like an embellishment. I'm, I'm, I'm trimming this down a little bit more because that sounds like an embellishment. Now, there was about this time Jesus, a wise man. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, and I, was, I guess I, technically you should exclude the and and the when, because that adds to the end of that sentence. And the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct at this day. So, take three from me. I'm going to try this one last time. And there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, Pilate, at the or he drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross. And the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct at this day. There isn't a need to remove this entire passage from Josephus and say it's inauthentic. 
What we can say, and I think we can say this reasonably, I tend to fall in the majority here. I would tend to say this was a Christian interpolation. Um, there's no reason to say that Jesus wasn't mentioned at all. He was mentioned in Josephus in that passage that I mentioned earlier. So there's no reason to, rem to remove him from mention altogether. The early Christians may not have quoted this verse, but they did quote Josephus as saying, hey, Jesus is mentioned here. So it's hard to imagine that Jesus wasn't mentioned at all. There's no reason to exclude this particular passage from Josephus altogether. Simply remove the embellishments. Remove the interpolations. So there you have it. There is my entire spiel on why, if you don't believe Jesus was a historical figure, you're stupid. The evidence is stacked overwhelmingly <laughs> against anyone who would say that. The, the multitudinous references to Jesus in, his, in a historical context is simply overwhelming. And the, I'm going to read, I'm gonna, this has gone way over 30 minutes. I apologize, guys. Again, I don't know why I ever think I'm not going to do this for 30 minutes. I'd like to read what um, Dr. Yamauchi said to Lee Strobel as a summary of what we can get about Jesus just as like a historical outline. And let's, um, let's look at just the non-Christian sources, um, which would be Josephus, the Talmud, Tacitus, Pliny the Younger. And there are some others, um, apparent, uh, it says others here. I haven't looked into any others. Are there others? I wouldn't doubt it. It's not like <laughs> the, rel the religion of Christianity eventually, eventually took over Rome, so I wouldn't be surprised that there are other early references to Christianity and to the historicity of Jesus. But just looking at the references, the things that we currently have, Josephus, the Talmud, Tacitus, Pliny the Younger. Um, then he went on, raising a finger to emphasize each point. We would know that first, Jesus was a Jewish teacher. Second, many people believed that he performed healings and exorcisms. Third, some people believed he was the Messiah. Fourth, he was rejected by the Jewish leaders. Oh, excuse me. Fifth, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate in the reign of Tiberius. Sixth, despite this shameful death, his followers who believed that he was still alive spread beyond Palestine so that there were multitudes of them in Rome by AD 64. And seventh, all kinds of people from the cities and countryside, men and women, slave and free, worshipped him as God. Which, excluding the Bible altogether, is a very, very impressive repertoire of who Jesus was and who he claimed to be. And now, guys... At the end of this message, having looked at the evidence for who Jesus was, I want to challenge you that Jesus was a lot more than just a historical figure. He was a lot more than just a wise man, a prophet, and a worker of miracles or magic. I want to propose that he was who he said he was, the one true living Son of God, the way, the truth, and the life, the only way to God the Father, that his death on the cross was not just the final act. In a, in a life spent dealing with the hypocrisy of Jewish leaders, but that his death was for us. He shed his blood on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven, and that he did rise again three days later, and that he guarantees his eternal life at his side forevermore if we will believe in him. And I want to challenge you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior right now, right this moment. Don't wait. Don't delay. Do it right now. And some of you know you need to. Don't wait. Don't delay. Do it right now. Don't wait for another reason. Don't wait for another excuse. Don't wait for another way to get away from the way. Take this path that you know you need to take and do it now. And if you want a model prayer to follow after to like seal the deal to make it official, pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I believe you died on the cross for me. And I believe you rose again three days later. Please, right now, be my God, my Master, and my Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And that's it. That's simple. You are now a Christian. You are now a member of the family of God. You're my brother or my sister, and welcome to the family. It is good to have you. Thank you for hanging in for such a long message. I way overshot that. That took way longer than I originally thought it was going to. It always does with me, for goodness sakes. Will this ever change? Probably not. Um, I don't know. 
I don't know many preachers that actually stick to the time limit. Very, very, very few. I guess I'll just join the majority once again on that as well. If I can encourage you, read the Bible just a little bit every single day. Whether it's online or whether it's an actual book, an actual copy, is going to help you know who your God is, what He thinks about things, and His plan for your life. Find a group of other Christians. Usually you're going to find that at a church who believe the same thing as you, that Jesus was the Son of God, He died on the cross and rose again, that this Bible is the Word of God, and that it's authoritative and acceptable and necessary for a good life as a believer. And one other thing, pray to God a little bit every day. Whether it's a good day or a bad day, whether it's a thank you God for the day or a God help me this day sucks, one way or the other, pray to Him. He hears and answers even those little prayers. Guys, thank you for hanging in there with me this entire time and for watching this entire video. I love you. Hopefully this was helpful to you and to your own studies and endeavors. And God bless.